Good evening, everyone. It's uh, not possible in a short talk to cover all the history of Fisher Row and its harbour. So really, tonight I can only paint a broad brush picture through the years and in no way cover uh, only but some of the interesting events and happenings. Now, firstly, you may well know that it's written that there's been a harbour at Fisher Row since the Roman times. Now, to my knowledge, there are no records to establish that fact. And it may be that as the Roman bridge is not Roman, neither is Fisher Row Harbour. However, the Romans may have used the bay at Fisher Row as a landing place and built a facility on the rocky outcrops at which the present harbour stands. But equally, they may have entered the town up via the River Esk, the contour of which was considerably different in their day and being wider and possibly more navigable. If we take a straight line from the old Roman fort at Inverness down through Market Gate or Market Street as we know it now, the original and one time entrance road into the town, we come from the fort to the harbour. And at the area of the harbour, when there, we found that there was a municipium. Now, a municipium is a Roman civilian settlement. Assumingly, it may well have been the families of the Roman soldiers who lived at the fort. But during excavations of the fort, they found oyster shells, mussel shells, fish bones, and that gives us an indication that there was a possible connection with the sea, but there's no mention of a harbour. We've also got to remember that in 1550, 1544, during the rough wooing, the Earl of Hereford sacked the town. And in 1548, Lord Grey raised the towns of Dalkeith and Musselburgh, at which time all the town records, other than the court and land register records that were kept elsewhere, were from that date backward destroyed. And it's not until 1592 that a harbour is recorded as in existence, but no mention of a pier. However, it is assumed from subsequent records that it was a simple, sim simple timber structure as in 1617, it was stated to be sufficiently dilapidated as to require repair, for which Edinburgh granted 200 pounds a year and Stirling donated 40. In 1626, 12 fishing skippers were listed by name. And at that time, the harbor had a single timber pier built on a small rocky outcrop. And in 1682, the council decided that the old timber pier was to be repaired with bulks of timber with stone filling and a, sto a single pier was actually uh, shown. Uh, this is an extract from a bigger map, but a single pier was shown uh, on a map of 1703. Now, just to give a little background, the Firth of Forth was the gateway from Scotland to Europe and it was also from Europe to Scotland. And the convention of local boroughs who controlled much of Scotland's trade established staple ports through which goods exported to Europe had to pass. Now, remember in these days, it was when, before we had roads, road transport, and before railways came into existence, that it was easier to move goods from town to town by sea. And for that purpose, all towns had their own harbour. And then 1847, or at least from 1540, 1506 until 1847, the staple port that was established on the continent in Europe was Veer, Camp Veer in Holland. And that was what happened was that the trade that was done within the fourth were, and small ships were transferred to berwick on tweed which was the main staple port, or one of the main staple ports for Scotland. And then they were put onto larger ships, sailed across the uh, North Sea, and then landed in Veer, then sub 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 put on, on, in, into smaller ships, and then uh, sent around uh, the whole ports there with the goods. The Dutch, who in those days were the masters of the North Sea, and it was them who really traded in and out of the ports of the Forth. And they established, as we know, uh, a Dutch connection with Scotland. And in common with many other fourth, fourth coastal towns, they, uh, the Dutch gave uh, a, a clock to uh, Musselburgh. 
and there is the clock in the in the old tower, the original Dutch clock, which they gave uh, in a 1496. And we know that there was the clock that in in the foyer that uh, of the old town hall, and we know that uh, actually it is still uh, there on display within the foyer. The new clock replaced it in 1873, and that's where it uh, now actually stands. Now, some years ago, council workmen were asked to clear out bags of paper from the cellars in the old town hall. And opening the bags just to ascertain their contents, they discovered old books and papers which they thought was more of importance than just the chuck away as rub rubbish. So they called in the experts who declared them to be the old records of the borough. And amongst the papers were the records of the trade in and out of the harbour in 1635. And this is a page, one of the pages from the book. And these records show that there was a considerable trade in timber from Norway. Now, I know you can't read that one, and there is the enlargement of one of the pages. And just to be helpful, that's what it actually said. The said John Addison, skipper in Carrel, entered his said ship called the Grenholm, laden with dales, trays, stumps, stinges, and burnwood. Now, I'm sure you all know what all these are, but just in case you don't, a bark is a small ship, screws are beams, stinges are wooden poles, laden is loaded, Trees are trees and dales are planks or deal. And these were the trade that were actually coming in to Musselburgh, uh, Fisher O Harbour at that particular time. Considerable amount of trade. And the books go on and on telling us just how extensive the trade was in timber. We also had a number of visitors to Musselburgh and to Fisher O in particular, Oliver Cromwell. Despite camping his troops on the links of the town during his Scottish campaign, he rejected Fisher Row in, in preference of Dunbar as his port of entry. However, on the 4th of September, he wrote to his friend, the Speaker of the House of Commons, he said, I have today shipped nearly 500 sick and wounded soldiers out of Fisher Row before commencing my retreat to Dunbar. As you know, he retreated to Dunbar. Uh, actually giving up the fact that he couldn't actually uh, get get into Edinburgh uh, was met by the Scottish forces who think that they had uh, trapped him, beat the Scottish forces and came back to Edinburgh and was successful then. In 1655, Thomas Tucker, who was the register to the Commission of the Excise in England, was sent to Scotland to give assistance in settling the excise and customs following upon Conwell's subsequent capture of Edinburgh. And he wrote, Musselburgh has an open harbour, suitably only for small boats or vessels. And in 1745, when we were having the young pretender coming into Scotland, there was a threat of the Jacobite invasion. And to that purpose, all the boats that were to be beached were to be disabled, having their oars and rudders removed and the guards to be posted on the harbour. But there, in actual fact, is the minute at di dictating that that was what the council had said that we had to do for fear of the uh, invasion by the young pretender. And also Daniel Defoe, who you probably all know as an author, who was actually a government spy. He was actually sent by the government to Scotland. Uh, he wrote a book on his travels in Scotland, but ostensibly he was there to see what was happening with nationalism at the particular day. And what he did say when he came to Musselburgh was that they call this a seaport town, but as a river, it's not navigable. People can wade over it at low tide. They do not meddle much with trading by sea. So that was actually Daniel Defoe's uh, report from Musselburgh. However, look at the new harbour. It was conceded in 1700 that the harbours of Fisherow and Magdalene were inadequate and the council wanted more direct entry into the town. They didn't like the uh, trade coming into uh, Fisherow Harbour and they felt it could be better served if it came up the River Esk. 
So they uh, applied to the parliament in 1703 to levy a tuppence on a pint of ale on beer for the purpose of building a new harbour at the mouth of the S. And that petition failed, and despite subsequent petitions, it was not successful until 1712. And the building of the new harbour at the mouth of the S began in 1713. And rocks at Fisher o Harbour were quarried, and under the penalty of heavy fines, the fishermen were contracted to carry the stones in their boats to aid the construction of the new harbour. However, that harbour was never successful as the number of freshes, that is the, the silting running down the river and the tidal currents had the effect of silting up the entrance such that in 1740, it was resolved to go back to the harbour on its original site at Fisher Row. And there's another mini book, it's very same as the other one, with the minute actually says that the, well, the, the resolve was in actual to abandon the harbour at the S and to go back to the harbour at Fisher Row. And now what we have have is that they decided that they would build an east pier. Uh, so what we've got now in the uh, fish at Fisher Row is the old wooden pier and a new stone pier. But the old stone pier uh, at the, or the big part, the new stone pier at that time had no parapet. So essentially, all it was was a breakwater with inner moorings, and that was completed in 1753. Now, apart from Hayes map in um, uh, 1824, there are no other images of the harbour. However, this painting that I know has not been seen before by very many people shows the actual harbour with its new east pier and uh, to the left, the old wooden pier that uh, was in existence. So you can see it's Fisher Harbour, you can see Arthur Seat in the distance, you can get some idea of what the harbour was like at that particular time. It's not fully known what work was subsequently done to the harbour, but repairs are recorded uh, occasionally over the years. Um, in the next 30 years, up to 1762, 1767, and 1776, plans for improving the harbour were submitted, but not taken up more than likely because the harbour commissioners had no money. In 18, so 1787, a plan by Cuthbert Clark of Dunbar was created to, to create wet docks, but that was not taken up. And the enlargement and improvement of the harbour was also proposed, but rejected. And other than the building of a key parliament on the East Pier in 1790, nothing was done. And I wonder how many of you who've walked up the pier have noticed that the original par parapet and the, or the original breakwater and the, the new parapet uh, was there. And there I took a few photographs the other day. There's the pier surface. The second arrow is the pier edge up to the height of the original edge of the pier. And then the other extension is the parapet right up that was put up in uh, 1790. And there is from the heart seaside of the wall, there's the original harbour wall, and that is the parapet that was actually put on at that particular time. Now, his map of 1824, which is one of the best maps of Musselburgh that there is, uh, shows the harbour as it was then. And I want you just to digress for a minute and I want you to look along the shore, foreshore, you will see all the timber yards just at the right hand side there on the seaside. That indicates the, the timber yards for Leith merchants and the, uh, gives an indication that Fisher Row was a much more important port than Leith at that particular time. The merchants would not have come to lease these lands and to import the timber from Fisher Row had it not been so. But I'm now going to just ask you to look along this line. It's the same map, but it's enlarged. Uh, just go back. You can just see if you go from the harbour, I don't know if my, my, my cursor actually is working. Here we are. Um, can you see just along from here, there is, says the back of Fisher Row, there are a double line. 
Well, you follow that double line and it goes from the harbour down along the shore front, right across the river, across a bridge, round the, the race course and down to Pinky, down to Barraclough, which was the land of Lord Hope. Lord Hope actually built this wagon way in 1812 and it was to take the coal from his uh, open cast mine at Barraclough up to the harbour. We assume for two or three purposes. One was for export, two was to uh, file the salt pans at, at uh, Joppa and also he had an iron foundry at Brunston. So we assume that the coal was there. The actual um, line was uh, cost 800 to 1,200 pounds to build at that particular time, which is a lot of money per mile, and it was two miles long. Um, it ran on a slope from Pinky up to the harbour, and it allowed the horses drawing four wagons, each with two, 400 weight of, 1,200 weight of coal up to the harbour. Um, uh, the fact that it was an incline downwards meant that the, the, the horses didn't have as much effort to do that and they were able to uh, come back to Pinky uh, with the empty wagons with not so much effort. But I have to tell you that, as you well know, that this was not the first wagon way in the area. And all the other wagon ways up to that particular time down at uh, Preston Pans, Kirkenzie, uh, and etc., they were all had wooden rails. And this was the first wagon way in Scotland that actually had iron rails. So it is unique from that point of view. Let's just take a quick look at the actual trading. From October 1830 to 1831, this was the trade in and out of the harbour, which was quite extensive at that particular time. But however, as we move along uh, a, a few years, we find out that the trade started to diminish. Uh, it, it really decreased. And the reason for the decrease there was that Leith actually started to become a main port and the, all the imports and exports were done mainly out of Leith as opposed to Fisher Road. However, at that time, there were still big ships like this coming in and out of Fisher Road. But one of the significant developments that took place at that time, and this was quite important because remember that one of the uh, uh, goods that came out, were exported out of Fisher Road was coal. And in order to bring the coal from the coal fields, the Edinburgh uh, and Dalkeith Railway Company extended its line from Nidre down to Fisher Road. That line carried um, coal from a number of different uh, mines in the surrounding area via Nidre came down to uh, Fisher Row to where the actual Shell Garage petrol station is in that triangle now. And that became the terminal uh, of the Fisher Row station. The original line was horse drawn and it only uh, was originally for taking coal, as I've said, for export to the harbour. But later in 1834, it began to run passenger services to the town to bring people from Edinburgh to take the sea air, to visit the Musselburgh races, and in 1826, to board the Musselburgh and Fisher Road Steam Packet Company's vessel, the Morning Star. Now there's the line and the depot there. You can see the lines coming in, out and out of it. The line coming down from uh, the, the north uh, uh, and, and down into the actual depot itself. And there was the uh, billboard for the this Morning Star. They're taking people trips from Fisher Row around the Forth. It was very successful, but only for a year. Not quite sure why it didn't last much longer, but I suspect the fact that Fisher Row being a tidal harbour and the steamer could not get into the harbour at every occasion. She had to anchor off and people had to get rowed out into little boats to go aboard. I think that the possibility that she was not uh, as successful. And what happened was that uh, she was sold a year later. 
uh, there's the billboard for her actually um, sale in 1836. Now the trains that ran down from uh, or to and from Fisher Row to other locations came down the line that ran from New Hales Junction along New Hales Road to where Little now stands and they ran across the main road and through the gates into the actual station. However, let's go back to the harbour. At this time, the harbour began to silt itself up in the same way as we were having problems with the harbour at the Mount of the Esk, they were having problems with the, with the harbour at Fisher Row. And it was a problem because the big ships like this could only get in at high tide and therefore it restricted the trade even more. So they had an idea that in 1835, what they would do in order to try to get the silt out of the harbour, they would build an archway in the East Pier so that when the tide came in, it would wash all the silt out and therefore um, make the harbour more navigable. However, what they forgot is when the tide went back out, it brought the silt back in again, and it was not really a success. And so in 1838, the tunnel was sealed up. And I don't know how many of you know or have seen it, but if you go down the harbour and stand on the West Pier and you look across, there you can see the archway or the vestige of the archway that was actually through the, uh, the, 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 the harbour wall itself. You can see the, the archway there, the one that was filled up. So you go down the harbour and have a look at that sometime. However, that, because it was not a success, they thought that a better way of preserving the depth of the harbour was to enclose it properly. And that is to build a new pier instead of the old wooden pier. And this was done under, in 1840 under an Act of Parliament, which said, I said that the old wooden pier was to be fully reconstructed of the and of old foundations. And this was done to a plan by Robert Stevenson and Sons. And that was a plan you can see uh, at the bottom, there's the, the East Pier and the proposal of the actual new West Pier in the harbour at Fisher Row, the map by Stevenson. This was subcontracted to uh, W. Kinghorn of Leith at a cost of £1,450 to be paid in instalments of £400. However, the final cost, instead of being 1450 was minuted as 1685 pounds two shillings and five pence. I would ask you, what has actually changed in the ways of costs and rising costs? Now the harbour with its two piers, um, as shown on this map, uh, was in existence. So we've now got Fisher Row Harbour, as most of us, well, not most of us know, uh, which some of us might know, but I don't think we're that old to know the old harbour as such. By 1884, the railway was more successful and profitable. However, there was a new station built at Musselburgh. They moved the line of, at New Hales, where it came from New Hales down to Fisher Row. They joined the line at New Hales and took it into the station at the mall in Musselburgh, and that was opened as the passenger station. And Fisher Row uh, goods, or the, the old Fisher Row station uh, on the triangle at the harbour became a goods depot and it became a coal yard. And it existed in that way until it was closed in the early 1950s. Now to increase and assist the export of coal, the harbour commissioners entered into agreement because they were having great difficulty now in getting trade into the, out of the harbour. Now they expected that, or they thought, that if they were able to run rails up both the East and the West Piers, it would actually help to do that. However, it was like a number of other things that happened at the time. It was just a bit too much and a bit too late. Uh, but all, all, all that works cost and the, a considerable amount of money and particularly 
the inability of the council to pay the interest on the loan to lay the lines along the West Pier. That really broke their back. And due to the diminishing trade was de a development too late. They also foolishly erected a crane at the end of the pier in the hope that they could assist with the coal exports, but that added to the, the costs and to their debt. And in 1850, that left the council with a large debt of £6,000, with no option other than to be declared bankrupt. At the subsequent court hearings, there was quite a considerable uh, court uh, uh, legal uh, arguments backwards and forwards, the council was declared unfit to uh, run its affairs such that legal representations, all subsequent finances were to be placed in charge of commissioners who were uh, given the um, authority to administer the town expenditure via a common good fund. And the councillors were given a small amount to disperse, but for major projects such as running lines up the harbour and any other such work, they would have to apply to the trustees for funding so to do. The harbour stayed much the same until 1938 when, and there we are, there's the, uh, back to have a quick look at the depot again, and there's the lines running up and down the east and the west piers. And there's a little note, more or less hoping that they will get um, the, the exports out of the harbour and the costs that they would actually uh, require to do. There is the line running down the West Pier. You can see just where the gentlemen are standing. And if you're as old as me, you will remember the lines that actually ran down the pier. The layout of the harbour has stayed very much the same as it is for, 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 for those four years, 19, uh, the, the, the time. There's the West Pier again. And I want to just point out something to you. Just at the top of the pier, you'll see a little hut. I'll mention this later on. But just remember that little hut there. But that's what the harbour looked like at the particular time with the rails running up and down the, the pier. And that's how the harbour stayed for some long, long time with very little um, being done to it. Uh, and the harbour had it, uh, other problems. I will come on to talk about the fishermen and the fishing uh, aspect of the harbour in a minute. But what was happening there was that the mouth of the harbour was wide. And that was causing all sorts of problems with the mooring of the fishing boats. And the fishermen were really concerned that this was doing damage to their boats and that they actually um, wanted to uh, ask for a, um, an extension to the harbour at Musselburgh. And this is the actual little note about it. They wanted an extension of the East Pier by 150 feet and also to a, a little extension to the West Pier. And the cost was £8,000, and the government was going to give a grant of £1,900. And there on 1938, the extension of the harbour was uh, applied for, and the outer East Pier was extended by 150 feet, and the West Pier by 21 feet. And the estimated cost was 8945 which again, the government met the uh, 1900 pounds of it. So what happened now was, and this is a photograph taken from um, a film, and this is the actual work that's going on. There was a steam crane up there, and that's the buttress end of the East Pier, where all the work is actually being, being done to extend the pier. And there's a little closer uh, uh, up picture of the same thing steam crane up at the back doing all the work there. And there is the uh, West Pier and the extension to the West Pier, uh, which is almost as identical to what you see today. And again, if you look just, if I can get my uh, my cursor on the go, seem to be working, there, uh, there we are. And just look at that little thing there. We'll talk about that um, uh, in, a, in a moment or two, right? Um, however, that now is what post-1939 the, the harbour was like. It now has its extension to the East Pier 
and its west pier is curved, so the mouth of the harbour was much narrower, which allowed uh, it to be more a camera in the harbour and stop, as my father said, the boats dodding on the bottom, because there actually is, Gavin, would you believe, a hard bottom on that harbour beneath all the mud. However, there was not much done from 1939 to the harbour uh, in the way of repairs or maintenance. However, there were occasions, so incident, that's the harbour as we all know it now. That's what it actually looks like. You can see the extension of the West Pier and the extension of the East Pier. Quite uh, obvious in that uh, aerial photograph. Apart from storm damage, and there have been quite a bit of storm damage to both the piers and to the buttresses over the years, um, there hasn't been a lot of work actually done to the uh, harbour itself. And it's gratifying to note that despite there being no investment, people, uh, groups like the Waterfront Group and the Yacht Club and other users are actually um, arranging or lobbying for all the change to be made and a more interest is being taken in the harbour and its surrounding area. Now, I would think that you would expect uh, that you would be remiss, remiss of me not to mention fishing. Now, there's no time to actually go into great details about fishing, but just to let you know that uh, the records of North East Church in 1837 said there were 2,410 people living in Fisher Row, mainly and almost totally all people with fishing or fishing backgrounds. And apart from the small amount of imports of China clay, rock salt, the Fisher Row ceased uh, to, the, 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 which ceased, the fishing fleet started to increase in size and it continued to use the port uh, as its harbour um, until the late 1960s. Now, originally, there's the trading barks in the harbour, and you can see on the left-hand side the fishing boats that were there. And the, over the years, the type of boat that were used in the harbour did change. The boats varied in size. They fished in the fort for oysters, whitefish, herring, shellfish. And in the 1930s, or up to the 1930s, most of them boats were sail propulsion. And then after that, in the 30s, they changed to engine propulsion. And there we are, there's the old harbor. I'm gonna run through this very quickly with the old sailing uh, fifes. Again, and again, there were three classes of fifes. There was class one, two, and three, the, that was whether there was a big one, a middle one, a small one, 30 feet, 80, 50 feet up to 70 feet. And there is, again, boats that were in the harbour at the time. These were the type of boats, big, big fifes, biggest fifes there were somewhere around about 65, 70 feet. There they are with their sails up and the changed over the years. There's the small fifes actually in the harbour altogether. And if you look, you'll see there's three boats there. One on the outside is an old fifey with an engine now. One on the inside is a fifey, not only with an engine, but with a wheelhouse. And in the middle is the new type of boat that came in in the mid 1930s. And that's the type of boats that were there in Fisher Row at the time. And they were uh, about 35 to 40, 40 feet long uh, skiffs, yawls, as they were actually called. And they became the workhorse of the fishing fleet, uh, not only of Fisher Row, but of quite around the Scottish coast. There we are, one or two more of Fisher Row Harbour. And in 1947, just after the war, grants were given to the fishermen to get larger boats and this is one of the larger ones that came in in 1947 and they again there are some of the larger ones in the harbour there's much more to talk about fishing uh, and fisher harbour but again we just don't have time to do that tonight and there's the fisher harbour at the last time where it was at its peak 
And there, all the fishing boats, there's about 30 odd of them there, were all at the winter fishing. And this is just about the time when the fishing fleet started to um, diminish and the boats, older boats uh, were not crewed, they, they were sold on uh, and the bigger boats came in and the whole changes happened in Fisherow at that particular time. Just wanted to just give you just a quick aside. Um, if you think that some of the barks that I showed you were big that came into the harbour, have a look at this one. Sure. This is the Annie 2. Um, she was brought into the harbour to be broken up. Uh, you can see that she's very light. Um, you see her water line is very high. She was brought into the harbour to be broken up. Last time I, I'm told that the trains and the wagons ran up the actual West Pier. And there is the a view of her from the West Pier and all the all the work that they were doing to try to um, uh, salvage the the Annie too, but uh, just thought you'd like to see just uh, that harbour uh, had unusual things happen to it. Now, quickly, um, let me pop through the waterfront area here. Um, I haven't mentioned fishwives at all. Uh, again, like the fishing and fishermen, and uh, there's far too much to tell. But what we can see here is that um, they were active in the town. Fishwives were active in the town till about 1980. And here you can see the fish that were fished in the fourth and landed uh, on the market at Fisher Row. Uh, and the women would come with the fish merchants to get the, buy the fish in the morning prior to them, uh, taking them to their customers. And uh, if you wanted to come, you would be able to view, but you wouldn't be able to buy but there was a market down in New Street uh, later on the night for the public, if there was any fish left over. Just behind the ladies is the um, Spence and Wright's coal co company, oil and cake mill. Now that mill made amongst other products, cattle cake and other animal feedstuffs. And they imported most of the raw material, locust beans, linseed oil and grain for making the material, uh, making that foodstuffs uh, into the harbour as well. Very big, big um, uh, works it was at the time. The um, oil and cake works, there, there, there. You can see the on the map. And there we are now, another picture of the West Pier. You can see the gate where the uh, Wag the, the wagons or the trains came out from the station. But in the background, the chimney is the actual chimney for the um, Olive Bank coal, coal mine. Olive Bank coal mine was there in the um, 1907, 1901. It opened in 1901. Uh, but unfortunately, it was flooded uh, or suffered from flooding and it closed in 1907. And we know if anybody who's as old as I am will know that Crudence took over all the extent, the land that was, was there at the time. Um, and if you look at the right hand side of the picture, my cursor is working. This here, this is all part of the oil and cake mill, which actually was knocked down. They knocked it down uh, on the, and replaced it on the site by the Musselburgh and Fisher Row store garage and creamery. And there we are. There was where the oil and cake mill was there, replaced by the creamery. There was the old creamery. And it supplied all the milk for a, a literally the whole of the town and the surrounding area at that particular time, the creamery. Hull Brothers had a garage at the top of Harbour Road, which is now Flats. And they also had a, also had a garage just for the long where the key now, or the, the, the key flats are. And I put these two things in just as a matter of uh, current interest. Would you just like to have a look at the price of the petrol? The petrol is one pound, one one pounds fifteen, one one five p. That is per gallon at that particular time. One one five p per gallon. 
So you work that out, it's about 30 odd pence per litre. Anyway, that was Hall's Garage that was where the actual key buildings are at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. That building further along at the Magdalene was Baird's Maltings. That is where Booker's now stand. That again relied on a lot of the uh, material coming in and out of the harbour. Baird's Maltings. And just along from Baird's Maltings was the uh, Pinky Pan Salt Works, uh, where rock salt originally was taken there from the harbour uh, by horse drawn wagons. At the land end of the West Pier, in this corner here, was a little shed. And it was the premises of Mackenzie, a sail and tent and sunshade maker. And here, there we are. And here we've got the actual shed itself. And I was donated copies of their actual day book with all the work that they'd done and for, who, for whom they had done it. And if you look at the top of the left hand page, you'll see Robert Fernie, you'll see the mother's joy and repairing a drogue mizzen sail, blah, 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 etc. That was for the boat called the Mother's Joy. And if you look at the uh, all the pages, it'll tell you all the boats that they actually had done. The one on the left, right hand side is for Walter Holly of the Pathfinder. And there is a painting of the Mother's Joy. It's a family boat. The sail there, the four sail is 1,520 odd square feet. The mizzen sail is about 1,300 square feet, and she carried a jib, or a, a, a jib sail was about 800 square feet, and there was a lot of canvas there. And that canvas was made, as you can see, by the um, Mackenzie's sail yard. They moved round the, a corner across the way to just where the back of the quay is now. That was their original site. And there is their there is your yard. Bit of a mess, but um, that was Mackenzie's inside of their yard. And subsequently, the fishermen who had been uh, uh, always had to re retire and uh, well not tar to tan their nets uh, did so down in Fisher Row at the, one of the tanneries. Uh, they built a capper uh, barking house there. It's still there, and that was done for the Fisher Row fishermen. Um, it now has other uses, but that was the purpose of that building, which still stands there. There's another entry to um, uh, Mackenzie's book, which I just uh, draw attention to you. Um, if you look at the right hand page, you'll see they're made a sunshade for the Rolos. <laughs> and at the top of the left hand page, the Musselboro Town Council, they built one new mast for the harbour signal painting the halyards as well. The harbour signal at the harbour. And there you are. There is the old harbour with the original harbour light. And that was what they were actually doing there. Anybody who's been along the pier, there it's another one there, another picture of her. And if you go onto the pier, you can see where the harbour light was actually bolted onto the parapet at the harbour. So that was the original light. The harbour itself, um, I, I should have just added that we're free builders, uh, boat builders yards. I have yet to find out where they were located. I know their names, but we don't know where they were located and we don't have much history of them. However, we have to say that um, on the West Pier, and I pointed out to you that there was a hut or a wooden hut. It was called the Stripping Box, and it belonged to the Musselboro Swimming Club and the Humane Society, which was founded in 1866. And they promoted swimming and organized galas at the harbor and hosted the annual swimming races from the harbor to and from the Beacon at Eastfield. And in the Odyssey Toon ceremonies during the HTA week, the Harbour Festival was always very, very popular. You can see the amount of people that are actually on the piers, both piers at the time to watch the Harbour Ceremony. 
and there was the another uh, another occasion for exactly the same thing and these people at the front of the pier incidentally they are all seated they are not standing they are all seated and it was always an evening to enjoy with not only the uh, um honest tunes event but with the swimming club uh, with their gala and their swimming galas now just to finish off the sands at the, the back sands as it's so called sands at the back of the harbor were always very very popular um, for visitors and despite the polluted waters they attracted a lot of swimmers and there we are there's an older uh, picture of the same on the east side there's another one there and you can see in the background on that picture you can see the maltings the, the roof of one of the maltings and there again you can see the chimney of Whitelaw's Brewery and you can see the, the, the roofs of the actual maltings on the promenade at Fisher Row. And there is the promenade as, as I knew it as a boy. It was not at the level, the sand's not at the level that it was now. When you go halfway along the promenade, you can only see two steps. There are 14 steps all the way down. And the this bit here at this end uh, reads on to a, a big buttress. This goes down to here, then the buttress comes all out down to there at that level, which at that particular time was actually how the uh, harbour looked when I was a boy. The promenade only extended to Bush Street, and then it was actually extended some later time on, and Oh, I just add on to you here that it was extended, uh, stopped there at Bush Street, and this was just ordinary grass here. And there were a number of hulks lying here at the end of Bush Street. There was a, a number, you can't see them, they're out of the picture. And it was a popular place to have your photograph taken uh, by people. There's my grandmother at the bottom of the street, standing beside one of these hulks, getting a picture taken. And there was the extension of the um, promenade all the way down to um, Beach Lane uh, and further down to Link Street. And you can see the steps that went down there. Uh, no marum grass, no elements grass, um, and the very popular with people at the, at the time. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that rather than go on, that I will probably finish there. Um, I'll conclude by saying that having known the harbour and the beach area for some 80 years, Fisher Row was much more, in my mind, Fisher Row was much more an attractive place then than it is now. But it's pleasing to see, and I hope that the harbour and the waterfront area is not being neglected and that it will actually be restored and made a more amenable place for uh, visitors once again. Thank you.